Good morning, church. Glad to see you here, and I hope that you're glad to see me. <clears throat> and if not, we'll try to fix that. We're coming to the close of this portion of a long journey where we've been thinking about rebuilding, restoring a foundation of worship, renewing commitment to the Word of God, rebuilding the identity of the church as the people of God. Next week begins Advent, and then comes Christmas, and then the New Year, and we'll take up new topics as the Lord leads us forward. But I can promise you this, these, this idea about rebuilding, about being the people of God, those ideas aren't going away. They're always going to be nearby, very close at hand. No matter what our topic is for the particular focus in any particular week or that season, because there's one thing that I know that God is doing in the world today. He is building His church. So we can expect that He's going to continue to press home to us the importance of what He's taught us over these past six months. As we consider what it is that God is doing in us, in His church, it's vitally important that we understand a very crucial point. Much of what we've looked at over the course of six months is related to the expression of our lives together as God's people when we gather for worship. And that's to be expected. Our weekly times of corporate worship are the primary vehicle God uses in building us up as His people. Sunday mornings are the one time when we are all together listening, hearing from God together to hear what is God saying to us as a body. The one time when we're all together being instructed, when we're encountering God together. But there's a lot more to our life together as a body than our Sunday morning experience. At least there should be. The primary point of being a Christian is not attending the meetings, right? It's living life as a follower of Jesus all week long. Sunday mornings are meant to prepare us for the rest of the week. And the rest of the week is meant to prepare us for Sunday mornings. If we are the church when we gather for worship, then we are also the church when we scatter to be God's people in this world. And living out that assignment of being God's people to this world requires something essential. It requires the intersection of our lives beyond the Sunday morning meeting. Our passage this morning comes from the book of Acts. It begins in the latter part of a longer story it began with Jesus meeting with the disciples after his resurrection, then follows his ascension into heaven, the sending of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and Peter's first sermon as a spirit-filled follower of Christ. The setting for this part of the story is the city of Jerusalem. It's on one of the three major feast days in the Jewish calendar when the city is overcrowded with devout Jewish travelers. They have come from a host of different nations around the Mediterranean basin, from northern Africa, from lands to the east of Israel. They've all come to celebrate the day of Pentecost, which happens 50 days after the day of Passover. And Peter has just finished telling the crowds that they've gathered to hear him. He's given the very first proclamation of the gospel. His message was powerful. It was very clear. God sent his promised Messiah Jesus of Nazareth, to you. He demonstrated that he was God's Messiah by performing miracles of healing. But you delivered him up to be crucified by the Romans. You had the Messiah put to death on a cross as if he were a criminal. But God raised him from the dead, and then Peter says, to which all of us, all the apostles, we were all witnesses. And God seated him at his right hand, when he ascended to heaven. And now, Jesus has poured out his Holy Spirit upon his people. Jesus, whom you crucified, is the Lord. He is God himself come to us. He is the Messiah, the promised Savior of Israel, for whom you've been waiting. And when the people heard this, the scripture says they were cut to the heart. Peter's words cut like a knife as the Holy Spirit opened them up to really hear to understand the weight of what Peter had said. And then the Holy Spirit just kind of leaned in on those truths. And the realization of what they had done pierced through their own excuses, pierced through their own indifference, pierced through their self-justification. 
Whatever sense they had had that they and God were just fine, thank you, it all fell apart when they heard the truth. They were responsible for killing the Messiah, and now they recognize that they had to respond. What must we do was their question. Have you felt that press from God in leaning in on something? Do you understand that it was your sins that put him on the cross? Have you taken responsibility for the death of God's son? Have you thought about the cost of your sin? It cost God the death of his son. And as a father, he felt that intensely. And so God has something to say about that to you and to me. When God speaks, it's not a matter for disinterested discussion of curious religious ideas. When God speaks, that's not the time to say, well, let me compare that with what I've heard from someone else. When God speaks, you must respond. And that response will determine the contours of your life, it will determine your future. It will determine your eternal destiny. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us. He reveals to us our personal guilt, our personal sin, our personal failure. He doesn't do that to make you feel bad. He doesn't do that to show what a pitiful excuse of a human being you are. No. He convicts us of our sin in order to show us our need so that we will come to him. He wants to remind us, this is not what I intended for you. I want you to understand how much I love you. I want you to come to me so you can be made right, so you can be made well, instead of continuing down this path of self-destruction. And so he points out to us our sin. <clears throat> well, the people heard Peter. They felt that cutting in their hearts, the Spirit's conviction, and so they said, what must we do? That, my friends, is the right question. And Peter's answer is crucial. If we want to understand, well, what is it that God is asking of me? What does he want? Why is he leaning on me in this way? <clears throat> Peter answers, here's what you need to do. Start by repenting. Start by turning away from your own sin, turning away from your own self-centered, self-referenced way of living, selfish ego-driven life from being your own master, doing whatever you feel like doing, thinking like you're in charge of your life. Just turn away from all of that. Start by turning to God as a desperate person who needs both forgiveness from the penalty of sin and deliverance from the power of sin. Start there. Because repentance is always the first step in conversion. There is, listen to me, there is no genuine faith apart from repentance. It doesn't exist. Genuine faith and therefore genuine salvation only comes with true repentance, never apart from it. And the Bible, from beginning to end, insists that repentance is a necessary step for you and I to be saved and to be transformed. And so Peter says, repent. And then he says, and be baptized in water, as a public testimony that you were repenting and seeking God's forgiveness. Now remember, John the Baptist had come three years before this with a message. Jesus had echoed it in his early ministry, endorsing John as a prophet of God. He said, this, this is the one that God has sent into the world. And his message, his ministry, were perfectly tailored to fit right into Jesus. So the apostles continued to follow what Jesus had showed them, given them example, when he embraced what John had done and he started baptizing followers. So they continued to do that. And they incorporated this message of repentance and baptism as the initial steps for anyone who wished to become a follower of Jesus. But they added a very significant detail. When they called for people to respond by being baptized, they said, you must be baptized in the name of Jesus. What did that mean? Why was it important? Throughout the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms and certain of the prophets, such as Isaiah in particular, we come across this idea of calling on the Lord. We even sang a, a phrase about that in, in one of our songs this morning. 
calling on the name of the Lord. And by the way, those two phrases mean the same thing. And those expressions reflect the very common experience of everyone in the ancient Near East and the distinctive experience of the righteous in Israel. Because the common experience of people in the ancient world, and quite honestly throughout the history of the world until quite recently, the common experience was this. Everyone understood that they needed help. Everyone understood they needed deliverance when they faced things like sickness, disease, calamity, war, famines, plagues, especially when they were facing death or facing some unavoidable evil. They needed salvation, they needed deliverance, they needed rescue, and so they would call out for help to the gods. Presumably they were there to help. And since there were so many gods, it was important to identify who it was you were asking for help and to indicate to that particular deity that you were willing to trade your allegiance to that god or goddess for their help. You're willing, so you'll call for help, you'll give your allegiance to them, in response, they'll help you. That was the understanding. So you would call on the name of a god, you acknowledge your need, you would request help, salvation from the god or the goddess, and pledge your allegiance in return. That was the common experience of all the cultures around in the ancient world. But the righteous in Israel, they knew something that the rest of the world did not know. The righteous in Israel understood that there was only one God, so calling for help to some other God was pointless. It was useless. There was no other God who could answer. And calling on the name of Yahweh for deliverance, excuse me, for deliverance or salvation wasn't a matter of just calling out and making sure all the other gods understood, well, I'm asking for help from this one. And it wasn't a shout out into the abyss, hey, is anybody out there that can help me? No, it was a specific calling on the name of Yahweh because it meant you were acknowledging this truth. There is no other God. I recognize when I call on the name of God, there's no other God to call on. And so I am saying, I'm committing myself to this truth. There's only one Savior. There's only one who has help, and that God is the God of Israel. There's no other God but you, and I'm asking you to save me. I'm abandoning all worship of other gods. I'm abandoning this idea that I can somehow save myself. I'm calling on you, God, to save me. I'm acknowledging you're the only one who can do that. And so I surrender all of me to you. I will be your man. I will be your woman. I will be known as belonging to you. I will call on your name. So when Peter says to the crowd of Jews who are listening to him there in Jerusalem that they must be baptized in the name of Jesus the Messiah, he is saying something to them that is absolutely revolutionary to every Jew. Something that requires a completely new understanding of who it is that they are understanding God to be. Peter is saying... You must confess your sins, repent, and acknowledge your need for forgiveness, which is something that only comes from God. Now, that much was familiar. But the next part was mind-boggling, because then he says, you must acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord, that Jesus is divine, that he is the God of Israel that he is the only Savior there is. To be baptized in his name is to call on him and to say, you are my God, you are the God of Israel, and you are the only Savior. You're the only one who has a salvation that's possible. He's, you're the only one who can save me. And then you must acknowledge, so I am therefore submitting to you as my Lord and my God. I will worship you alone. I will be identified as belonging to you. I am pledging my allegiance to you you will be my God, we will be your people. That's what it means to be baptized in the name of Jesus. It's not just the tagline at the end of the prayer so you know you're done. Rebuilding the church's identity begins with this truth, and it, and it never moves away from it. Our foundation is Jesus Christ. Our foundation is not religious ideas, it's not social progress. It's not cultural development. It's not moral codes and commitments. It's not activities. It's not events. It's not nice people. None of those things are what we're building a church on. Personal allegiance 
total surrender to the person of Jesus, the living Lord, the resurrected Messiah, that is our foundation. We recognize him as fully God, also fully human. He is the unique Savior. There is no other way to know God except through him. We have no other truth but that as a foundation. He is the unique Savior, and responding to his call means I'm going to abandon my attempts to be good on my own. I'm abandon my attempts to be good through some other religious means. I'm abandoning all of that. I'm coming simply and humbly to the cross. I'm confessing my sins. I receive his forgiveness, and I choose then to let him live his life through me by inviting him to be my Lord, receiving the Holy Spirit as the indwelling person of God in silence. That last point, by the way, uh, is worthy of a whole series of sermons because the promise of the Holy Spirit was actually one of the main points of Peter's sermon. It was something he was driving toward. You've heard it often, and rightly so, that Christianity is not just another religion. It is primarily and fundamentally a relationship with the living God through the person of Jesus Christ. Well, that relationship is possible because when you respond to God with repentance and faith, He sends His Holy Spirit to live within us. And the result of having God's Spirit within you is that you're changed. You're spiritually alive, you're born again, you're cleansed from sin, and you are empowered to live an entirely different way of life. A life that's much more than just trying to be a good person. When we surrender to Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God takes up residence inside us and He begins to make Himself known. I don't know if you've figured that out yet. He has a very uh, persuasive way of letting us know what's going on when He comes inside. He starts by cleaning up the house. He starts throwing out some stuff that didn't belong there in the first place. Okay? And He replaces them with His stuff. He starts cleaning out the lust. He starts cleaning out the bitterness. He starts cleaning out the unforgiveness and the resentments. He starts changing the way you think and the way we speak. The Holy Spirit starts reminding us, well, this is what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. This is what it looks like to be identified with him and his people. He gives you hope, a hope that's not based on what you heard from the news or how you're feeling. He gives you faith that isn't just positive self-talk. He gives you convictions about what is right and what is wrong that aren't just your opinions or your preferences or what you learned at the table as you were growing up. He gives you something that's based on the character and the nature of God himself because he is, in fact, God the Spirit alive in us. And so we're converted. We're changed. If you haven't been converted, then you need to get there fast. Because just sitting in a pew won't cut it. He gives you a new life in place of a life that was going nowhere. He promises to walk with you every day. Well, Peter finished that sermon that morning, and the people responded by repenting and being baptized, and, and immediately the disciples had a problem. <clears throat> There's about 120 of the disciples who were gathered together that Pentecost morning. That may have been most or nearly all of the disciples of Jesus who'd remained faithful to him after his crucifixion. Now, there's 3,000 new followers right away. Boom, are added to the group. Well, if all you're looking for is crowds, that looks like a win, right? Okay, get the signatures on the cards, get some donations for the campaign, put out the press release, move on to the next event. We've got some traction now. See, God's after something much bigger than just crowds. He's building a people in whom he dwells, among whom he can move, among whom he can make himself known. He is building a people who know his truth, who follow his ways, who display his character, a people whose thinking and whose attitudes and her way of responding have been shaped by his influence, who are vessels through whom he can love and heal the world. Well, how does he do that? How does he build a people? He starts where we started in May. He starts with the building blocks that we've been given. He awakens us to our need for worship, to meet with God, to encounter him personally, to make him our highest priority, to learn how to respond to his mercy and to his grace with thanksgiving and praise. And then he starts transforming us through his word, his teaching. Because our lives are supposed to be transformed as we come more and more into conformity with him, learning who God is, learning what he's like, learning what he wants for us, what he made us to be. 
what it means to be like him. And as we submit to his word, we take it into our hearts and lives, we gain wisdom. We gain understanding, right understanding, and we start to grow in godliness, moral and spiritual improvement. Now, right understanding and moral and spiritual improvement, those are not what we present to God so he'll accept us. They're not our ticket to ride the bus to heaven, okay? They're the fruit of a life of discipleship. They're the evidence that Jesus Christ has come to live inside us by his spirit. And then he brings us into a family. And he starts shaping our life toward godliness so that we can practice the ways of the kingdom of God because that's going to take more than just your efforts. It's going to take a, fam- a, a village, a, a community, a people of God. You have to be joined to his people because God isn't building lone rangers. He's not building rugged individuals. He's building a people and invites us to join it. So this description in the book of Acts in chapter 2 gives us a picture of the earliest church, shows us the key ingredients in the creation of a community that is built on Jesus Christ. So let's look at them. The first thing I want to note is what I've been saying throughout the message so far, and at the risk of hammering this mercilessly, this new community consisted of new people. People who had been born again and identified with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. All of the people, think about this, all of the people who responded to Peter's message were Jews. Which means they already thought of themselves as belonging to God's covenant community people. By virtue of the fact they'd been born into a Jewish family or they'd converted and they'd followed Moses' law, but now they're having to re-identify with God and his people on a completely different basis. On the basis of being followers of the Messiah. Because their identity as the people of God wasn't based on being Jewish, it was based on being disciples of Jesus, even though they were all Jews. You see, their identity as Jews hadn't changed. But their their basis for claiming a covenantal relationship with God had now changed. They were still Jews, but now they had to relate to God by being a follower of the Messiah. And now it was based on a new covenant that he had initiated and sealed with his death and resurrection. So this new basis for identification as a people meant they had to learn some new commitments. They had to learn some new patterns, new ways of living that reinforced this sense of of being a distinct people. Now, for quite a while, they continued to live as they had lived before, following the patterns of Jewish customs prescribed by the law. But gradually... The realization grew that the nature of their unity as a people was not based on the law of Moses, even though they're continuing to practice it, to live by its principles. It's now, their unity is now based on the teaching of Jesus. And that meant they had to let go of this idea that what made them the people of God was that they were circumcised and they kept the Sabbath and they kept kosher laws so they could embrace the truth that they were the people of God because they'd been born again by the Spirit of God and were followers of Jesus the Messiah and he was their Lord, and that this people could include non-Jews. A thoroughly revolutionary idea in every sense of the word revolution at that time. So what did that new life look like? What did this new community of God's people look like? Luke tells us. Number one, he says, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They intersected with Jesus through the apostles' teaching. This was the most significant, the most characteristic feature of the life of this new community. They were committed to learning Jesus' teaching and applying it in their lives. It wasn't casual. It wasn't occasional. It was central to the life of the first Christian church. And it's been central to the life of every Christian church throughout the ages and around the world. And if we're going to be the first Christian church that God has called us to be, We must learn to be single-hearted in our devotion to God, to Jesus' Word. Listening to Him, learning from Him, following Him. I've noticed something, you may have noticed it too. The world, particularly Hollywood, loves to mock people who go to Bible studies. If there's a character on a TV show that goes to a Bible study, it's always some weirdo. 
So the character who goes to a Bible study, who doesn't go out partying or social climbing or getting into trouble, well, they're, they're mocked. We're seen as ridiculous, naive, infantile even. The kind of people that everyone just kind of rolls their eyes at and gives each other a knowing smirk, like, oh, there they are again. But you know what? When I think about the people I've met at Bible study and the things that I've learned from going to Bible studies and the things I've seen in other people who have learned from going to Bible studies, whether they're an academic professor type or a common, ordinary Christian. What I've seen is that I can't think of a richer soil for building a life that actually matters. The truth is the world may mock us for going to Bible studies, but you can't grow up spiritually without the Word of God. It's impossible. You can go to church for 50 years and never grow up if you don't get into the Word of God and start learning what it says. I've known people like that. I've known people just like that who faithfully go to church for decades and never grow up spiritually at all. And the only conclusion I could draw is either that A, they they were never really born again at all. They they never had a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. Or B, they simply never bothered to give themselves to the task of learning to follow Christ by learning His Word. On the other hand, I've known lots of people who came to faith in Christ with almost no knowledge, zero knowledge of the Bible, who continued to grow, became very knowledgeable, spiritually mature leaders because they gave themselves to Bible study and made it their goal to understand the Bibles. I think of an older man I knew. He once told me that when he came to Christ, he was an alcoholic, was desperate, came to Christ, got saved. He told me the only thing I knew, literally the only thing I knew was that Jesus' last name was God. That's it. Okay, but... He became a leader in a recovery group for alcoholics, and he started sharing the truths he was learning from Bible study. I think of another friend of mine. He served faithfully in pastoral ministry for over 30 years here in the area. When he came to Christ, he was one scary dude. Came straight out of drug dealing with some very uh, scary connections, filled with suspicion, and no little interest, no interest in the Bible at all. But he changed when his life intersected with Jesus and God transformed him as he started studying the Bible. And he's a great pastor today. For followers of Christ, the evidence that we are really following is seen in the way our lives are increasingly shaped by biblical values and teaching. Our thinking is characterized by conformity to the will of God. We want to find God's answers to the problems we see in the world and the problems we see in our own life. We're not just looking to find a popular saying we can mouth. We subject our own opinions, our preferences to the scriptures so they can be measured, they can be refined, even remade entirely. Because the lives of disciples are constantly intersecting with the life of Jesus through his teaching and they're changed as a result. Now the other features of the life of this earliest church, Luke tells us about them, they all involve life intersections with other people in the community of faith. And all of these things were equally impactful for their lives, for the overall life of the church as a whole. But what made them so important is that they grew out of that first characteristic. As those who are now identified as being followers of Jesus by their allegiance to Jesus, they were devoted to listening to his word, to learning his teaching, living according to what he said. And so that impacted everything else in the community. So these new Christians not only devoted to the apostles' teaching, they're devoted to several other activities as well. Three particularly that Luke notes, makes note of, fellowship, breaking bread together, and prayer. Now, each of those subjects worthy of their own sermon. Perhaps I'll come back to them at a later time. This morning, I just want to point out what I believe is the most important thing to note about these activities which is that all three, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer, all three involved sharing of their lives, not just going to meetings. When we think of fellowship, we often think of something like chit-chatting over donuts or coffee and 
maybe doing something fun as a group. Those kind of activities can qualify as fellowship. But what makes having coffee with someone or going bowling with people from church, what, what makes that fellowship is not the activity. It's not whether or not it was fun. That doesn't make it fellowship. What makes it fellowship is when what we're doing is helping us to grow deeper in our relationship with one another as fellow followers of Christ and helping us to grow in our ability to do just that. The word that's translated fellowship, the Greek word koinonia, it, it has the idea of sharing something that is in common. Fellowship requires sharing, not just proximity. Okay? There's a giving, there's a receiving, opening up, allowing someone else in, and daring to enter someone else's world, someone else's life. Fellowship isn't attending a meeting. A meeting can be a great starting point for fellowship. Fellowship is sharing our lives. It's what happens between friends or between people who are on their way to becoming friends. In between the times, they're in the meetings. It's found in those innumerable threads of connection that bind people together, people who have decided to follow Christ together and to help one another along the way as they go. And one of the most notable ways this koinonia was built was through eating together. Luke says, breaking bread. The church in Jerusalem took their meals together. Now, not all of them in one place necessarily, and not usually anyway, but from house to house in small groups, extended families and friends, they shared what they had with one another, reminding each other of how Jesus had given them this example, how he'd invited them to table. He'd eaten with sinners in anticipation of the great feast that would mark the end of the age. He had modeled for them what it looked like to trust in grace and to extend grace to others by inviting strangers to become friends, inviting uh, outsiders to come in and be welcomed, eat with them as equals, giving welcome as they had been given welcome from their divine Lord. Because there's something that happens when you eat with people, especially when you do it in your home, and most especially when you do it in a way that makes them feel comfortable and welcomed. All kinds of marvelous things happen when you take the time to share your life over a meal. The other thing that Luke mentions about the early church is their, their, church is their devotion to prayer. Now, prayer is a particular interest for Luke, so it's not unusual for him to mention it here. But what I want us to see is that Luke is not talking so much about private prayer. That's certainly vital for personal spiritual life and spiritual growth. Jesus says as much. But Luke has corporate prayer in view. And he's going to emphasize that in the chapters that follow this. It's prayer together, whether that's in a large group that's gathered in the temple or in smaller groups that are meeting in homes following a shared meal, or very early in the morning before the workday starts. Because the life of the church is carried through prayer. <clears throat> sharing our pains, sharing our concerns, sharing our joys and our thanksgivings. Holding one, and up, holding one another up through the challenges that we face, facing persecution together, interceding for the weak, Contending against the enemy on behalf of the lost or on behalf of the sick or, or the needy. This is the work of the church as we pray together. And as we do so, God knits hearts together. <clears throat> if you really want to get to know someone, the two best things I know to suggest to you are these. Number one, work with someone on a project. Or number two, pray with them over a period of time. Those two things, you do one of those two things, or both of those two things, you're going to know that person's heart pretty soon. You're going to find out who they are, what they're really like, what they really believe, what they really care about when you share working with them on a project or praying with someone over time. What distinguished the earliest church, what made them noticeable was this. Their lives were constantly intersecting. If I'd had a way to put together a video up here, 
It showed something like those, one of those family circus things where the kids going all over there. Only there's about 700 of them and they're all going like this. That would have been what the early church was like, just constantly intersecting their lives. They were intentionally, continually involved with one another in ways that built deep connections among them. They knew one another's needs, and so they worked together to meet those needs, and they built friendships along the way as they did. That communal love for one another made them stand out among all the other Jews in that city. Those who were seeking for something better than what they had saw their lives and wanted to join them. And those who hated them heard their devotion to Jesus and wanted to attack them. But no one ignored them. They were just too different. And that difference was the presence of God. That difference was the love of God. When the love of God comes to reside in us as His people, we share that love amongst ourselves and with the world, the world sees something that it doesn't know. It sees the visible reality that there is a God and that there's only one way to know Him, and that's through Jesus. And that is how God builds His church. And that's what we're going to see Him do here as we give ourselves to this.